Hi, welcome to the Load Restraint Fundamentals Training provided by Turb New South Wales and the NHPR. My name's Drew Thompson from Logistics and I'll be running through this course today. This course is provided by the funding provided by the NHPR through the Heavy Vehicle Safety Initiative uh, in combination with uh, Turf New South Wales. Turf New South Wales, with the help of members, have coordinated and facilitated this uh, system development and today's training session. So who is Ingistics? So Ingistics is a small engineering consultancy who specialise in load strength design. Um, we mainly focus on load strength design for heavy vehicles, anything from palletised freight through to heavy concrete precasts. We do a little bit of traffic management, uh, vehicle rollover and accident investigation, as well as some storage and handling efficiencies. So to start off our, our talk today on load strength, so what, what do we need uh, load strength for? So first up, the straight, pretty straightforward is obviously we want to keep everyone safe. So you know, without load strength or sufficient load strength, things generally won't stay in the back of our heavy vehicles. Uh, property protection, so depending on how much, how expensive what you're, you're transporting, it could be the, the issue that, you know, if, if it gets damaged in transport, that's a fair cost and all the time delay to try and either get new components out or, or new build new new items or it may delay a project. Uh, increase in efficiency, so if, if you have a really good understanding of load restraint, um, you might be able to design a suitable load restraint system that actually reduces the, the, the current restraining method depending on uh, what you're doing uh, and that, therefore that will reduce your costs. So what could go wrong? As I sort of outlined before, you know, incorrect or inadequate load strength can be a risk to a, a lot of people on the road, mainly other road users and or the driver. And just by misunderstanding some of the, the fundamental principles can lead to some of these sort of um, outcomes that you see in the pictures above. Um, a lot of these incidents are all from fairly uh, straightforward, fundamental understanding of how load strength works. I'll just start off with this video here. With Jane Doyle and John Riddell. Good evening. First tonight, their parents should be buying cross lotto tickets. Dozens of children narrowly escaped death this morning after their bus was speared by three flying steel girders. The bus was at a stop on Port Rush Road just after 8 a.m. when a delivery truck crashed into it, catapulting three steel beams through a window. I wasn't sure what was happening. I just had this huge noise. And then the bus came through the window. My friend ducked and it went right over his head. Then I heard screaming, so I came outside. Kids are running inside the bus, going crazy. Four teenage girls were taken to the Women's and Children's Hospital with minor injuries, among them Trish Ball's daughter, Ashley. Oh, she's OK. She's really shaken up, got a, um, hit both her knees and, uh, yeah. Not feeling too well, but she's okay. The car driver who crashed into the truck and another student were taken to the RAH. His brush with death was so close, some of his hair was stuck to the end of one of the beams. We've had um, patients with head injuries um, as a result of um, contact from the beam. We've had some very lucky people involved in this, and we've had some people that have got some neck injuries as well. They've gone in probably around about five metres inside the bus, but they've travelled uh, over one of the over one of the seats and basically along the the corridor. It's debatable whether seatbelts would have helped or hindered the students on board. But what we do know is that their quick reaction when the beam struck probably saved their lives. We are amazed that in an accident like this, there were no serious injuries as a result. Major crash officers were investigating whether the truck was overloaded and the girders adequately secured. Peter Caldicott, Seven News. So you can see in that video there that that's probably as close as uh, close to a fatality as you, you ever want to get. A um, few few millimeters either way probably could have changed the outcome of that that accident. So what went wrong with that accident is that, again it's uh, all comes down to understanding the fundamentals of load restraint. So that there we had a steel ladder rack with some fabricated steel beams sitting on top of that ladder rack. Uh, that gives us a steel and steel friction in face. It's very slippery. So when you put your tie down straps over the top, 
it doesn't create a, a very strong restraint force between the items and that coupled with the, the the multiple breasts across the top of that ladder rack means that this when you throw your tie down strap over the top of that load it only holds down the two outside items because the the, the strap doesn't actually go over the top of or bend over the uh, middle of those items there's nothing holding them in so they come out in what we what we call a spear and failure so um, some of those fundamental, you know, under, if those those fundamentals were understood by the the driver or the person restraining that load, that probably would have had a different outcome. So, who do we think is responsible for that potentially? If you're looking at it from a COR perspective, we could have uh, the consignors whoever whoever organised that load to be picked up and put on that truck. It probably wasn't quite a very suitable vehicle for that type of load. Um, the person that loaded that vehicle. Um, uh, the transport operator or the transport owner of that vehicle and you could find them may, may be all those roles together so just for some key uh principles that that, that accident could have been prevented so how do our loads move so again pretty straightforward so if we're talking in the forwards direction uh usually it's from braking uh going down a hill we want the load to keep, you're traveling forwards and you brake and the load wants to keep going forwards uh, rearwards direction accelerating so from a standstill you go truck moves forwards and load wants to fall off the back of the truck um, up and down hills can also affect that as well as airflow airflow talking about sideways uh, corners bend swerving can put a, a big sideways force into the load uh, the road camera will also have effect on that sideways force so if you're looking at something like a roundabout he has a very tight radius um, it's off cambered and you also have that curve in the middle. So if you imagine to hit, you may, if, you, if you happen to hit that curve at the same point, that puts a large force through your load. Um, vertically, you got rough road, speed humps, suspension. So depending on where you got your load, on a rigid, you're going to have a, a different vertical force down the back of the tray there compared to the front due to the springboard effect. So what's our legal compliance when it comes to load strength? So we've got the, this thing within the heavy vehicle national law. So if you go to Schedule 7 of, of the heavy vehicle national law, you'll see a, a section that discusses the performance standards. So this is what you legally have to restrain your load to uh, when out in the public road. So if you're looking at the forwards direction, we've got 80% of the force. Uh, sideways and rearwards, we've got 50% of the, the load. And vertically, we've got 20%. So what does that mean? Um, basically, what that means, it's the force we have to restrain our loads to um, and, and prevent movement. So if you're looking at a, a one ton load here on the back of this truck, we're talking about the forwards direction, we've got to hold 80% 80 of that load. So we've got to provide 800 kilos of force in the forwards direction. Rearwards and sideways, we have the 50% requirement. So that means out of our one ton load, we've got to provide 500 kilos of restraint in those directions. And then vertically, it's 20%, so therefore, out of that one ton load, we've got to provide 200 kilos of downforce on the load if we're, if we're utilizing something like friction in a tie down restraint. And see, these these numbers here aren't telling you how you have to how you have to restrain the load. It's telling you how much force you have to apply to the load. These factors are mainly come from uh, g forces that are measured um, in in a testing environment for a minor accident. So what sort of situations does this cover? Um, play this video. So we're looking at force there, that braking event, that would generally be somewhere in the realm of a 0.6 to 0.7 G braking force. Um, our performance standards state we've got to have at least a provide at least a 0.8 G force in that forwards direction. So what that means is our forces that we've got to restrain on the load to aren't a major braking event like the video shown there. It's it's more of a, a small impact force. So if you've had any sort of load shift um, in the forward direction, especially, and you haven't actually impacted 
another vehicle. Um, that just shows you load strength isn't at the level required to meet the performance standards. So what's our options for compliance? So there's two, two, two key options we're going to present today. So one of them is the national uh, the NDC, which is now owned by, uh, looked after by the NHVR, is the Load Strength Guide 2018. So this is a practical reference, contains a lot of different types of loads um, and, and a lot of helpful information, but it's very broad and it's not very, it doesn't cover every option. Um, it does have tight end tables and things in the back that can help you determine tight, tight end restraint. Um, the other option we've got, which we'll go, which we'll go through in the, another video, is the developed tie down restraint guidelines. So these are guidelines that are certified to meet the performance standards that I described before, meet our compliance to the law. And these are certified by a chartered engineer to, to ensure they, that they meet those requirements. So what are our load strain options? So there's a couple couple different methods you can use to meet your load strain performance. The main one you see and, and the one that uh, is used within the turf industry a lot would be the tie down restraint. So what that is, it's a, you're tying down load to the deck of the truck and then using a friction force to prevent it from moving. The other option you got is containing, which is a direct restraint method, which uses the body of the vehicle to prevent the load from moving. You got blocking, which again is another direct restraint method using things like headboards, uh, tailgates, tailboards, side pins, and, and side gates to prevent the load from moving in all directions. And then you've got attaching, which is like a, a, a using a chain or a lashing to directly restrain the load in all directions for prevent it from moving. So we're looking at tight end restraint. Like I said, it's probably the one that's most used throughout the transport industry in Australia. Basically, the, the way the system works is you have the weight of your load plus the lashings pushing the load into the deck of the truck. That then develops a friction force. So when the load tries to shift, that friction force will directly oppose that, that movement of that or that shift in the load. So this system is very, very heavily reliant on the amount of friction you have. So the less friction you have, the less load strain you have in a tie down system, but also how much downforce you get pushed into that load from the pretension in your lashings. So friction is critical for a tight arm restraint system. So how important is that friction? So I'll go through a couple of scenarios here. So if I've got two IBCs on the back of a truck, that is straight to the deck uh, with a steel to steel friction. We generally call a steel to steel friction around a 0.2 friction factor. What that means is we get roughly 20% of the force pushing down converted into that friction that resulting friction force. So if I'm looking at a two one ton IBCs, you're looking at 10 webbing straps over the top of that load to secure it in the tie down system due to the really slippery friction force. So that's obviously not very practical and not likely to be used and likely to crush the IBCs. So knowing a little bit about friction, you know, that timber on steel is a bit of a number. So that, that's around a 0.4 friction factor. Same load again, same lashing type just purely changing that friction factor or that friction interface. We're now down to four webbing straps for that, those two IBCs. So again, most likely impractical uh, for, this, for the load and the mass, but it just shows you the difference in changing that friction force and the IBC is unlikely to take that load. We move on to any slip load mat. So this is a specialized uh, rubber that's certified to have at least a 0.6 friction coefficient or higher. With this here, if we loaded the same two IBCs of back truck, we'd be down from down to two webbing straps. So just purely from moving from a steel and steel friction to the anti-slip method, we've cut down uh, eight eight straps just purely from changing out friction. So where do you usually get caught out? A uh, couple of things. So I think things like the example of previous IBCs, somewhere where you've got a frame or stillage or some sort of um, component where you're lifting onto the truck and it can be dropped directly onto the truck due to it having something like fork pockets. Um, generally, sometimes you get away with it because a lot of times if it doesn't have, if it's a steel item and it doesn't need fork pockets, you'll use something like timber dunnage to go underneath the load. 
Other case could potentially be something like a steel pallet where you're loading that straight to the deck and yet there's no resulting, um, no friction improvers between it just because you don't need it to get it on and off the truck. So similar to the IPC. So like I went through before, the other key factor to our tie down restraint is the amount of force we can push the load down into the deck of the truck. So that's determined by the pretension we can develop in our uh, lashings. So if you're looking at a standard 50 mil webbing strap, it will generate a pretension in in the range of around 300 kilos average. So that's your standard short handled push up webbing ratchet or under truck winch. You can go up to a high pretension webbing strap. So this is a pull down ratchet with a longer handle and that will generate around 600 kilos average pretension. And then when you move into your chain binders, an average maxi binder will give you around 750 kilos pretension and a turnbuckle will give you around a, a ton of pretension force. So this is how much that tension is developed in your in your lashing when you do the binder or ratchet up with around 50 kilos of force on the handle. That's the standard assumption. So along with that lashing tension is the amount of downforce we get out of that. So the amount of downforce out of that lashing tension is determined by the angle of the lashing. So as you can imagine and seeing this picture here, if you've got a very shallow angle, so the angle that we're talking about here is the deck of the truck to the, the webbing strap itself, if you've got a very shallow angle, not a lot of that lashing tension will get converted into a downforce. So the lower lashing angle you go to, the less of that lashing tension is going to be converted to a downforce. And you can you can do a similar thing like this it, by uh, if you go and pull a strap up that's going over the top of a box, it doesn't take a lot of effort to pull that strap up because there's not a lot of downforce when it's going straight, where it's very low angles. Whereas the higher you go up in your lashing angle, so somewhere like this where it's a 45 degree, you're getting more more components of your, your lashing tension actually being converted to a downforce. So when you're at a full two abreast pallet space, you're nearly getting the complete lashing tension applied as a downward force to your load. Generally, we want to aim to be above 30 degrees or higher. So how does this all work together? So in the back of that load strength guide book I talked about earlier, there is uh, some lashing tie down tables. These are outlined a whole heap of different combinations and possible loading scenarios that you could have. And determine uh, an outline for you how, how that works in your restraint. So what this does, this takes your, your friction factor, your lashing tension, and your lashing angle, and puts them in all, all the calculations into a table that's a, nice and easy to follow. So if you look at these examples we've got over the side here, so we've got an 800 kilo IBC on medium friction. So if you go through the table here and look at, we haven't got it blocked forwards from medium friction. We're at 60 degrees. That means our straps are giving us 510 kilos of restraint capacity. So if we're at 800 kilo IBC, we need two straps to be applied to that load. Similarly, if you look down the, the, the one down the bottom here, we now got two of these IBC, 800 kilo IBCs, so we're at 1.6 tonne per row. We're going to again on medium friction. So if we go through that table again, we're at uh, medium friction, but our lashing angle or strap angle has gone to 90 degrees, so we're at 600 kilos per strap. So for our 1.6 tonne or 1600 kilo row, we need three straps for that to be compliant. So these tables in the back of the book are all designed to meet the, the performance standards outlined in our national heavy vehicle law. If you look at different method, methods to measure lashing angle, you, there are apps on, on most phones these days that will measure angle, or you can go the old school rise over run method so a 45 degree angle will be one across and one up. A 30 degree angle will be two across and one up and a 60 degree angle will be one across and two up. So through use of these tables, you should be able to work out for a variety of different items, how, how to restrain them and how, many, how much, how many lashings you require. So these, this is how people get caught out in the two and a half ton strap. Um, depending on your loading configurations is what will determine how much that strap can actually restrain. The two and a half tonne is more of a uh, pulling strength rather than the actual tie down capacity of that strap. 
So what are key risks for our tie down system? So oversized loads, you have a load that goes outside the depth with the truck, your lashing angle no longer is the, the deck of the truck. The lashing is actually the underside of the, the oversized item to the lashing, so it can get very shallow quickly. Uh, gaps between the load are also another issue. You have gaps between load as you go down the road. The, la the tension of the lashing is pushing downwards, but it's also pushing the load inwards. So bumps and vibrations will it cause that to slowly walk to the centre, and therefore you'll lose all your tension in your straps, and therefore you'll lose your tie down capacity. Looking at bundles in the loads. So issue you get there is a lot of slippery items together. How can we unitize them? So doing something like a belly wrap or a choke can help package those together. So using the strap to actually package the items together and then tie it down. And I think the, the last thing to be aware of with the tie down situation is also multi-breast loads. So you never will end up in a scenario where you have a multi-breast item and throwing a tie down strap because uh, as you can see in the picture here, you hold the two outside items together, but that inside item will have no downforce applied to it, and therefore we won't have any tie down restraint out of it. So there's nothing stopping that from moving forwards and rearwards in that, that system. So can you tie down a wheeled tracked item? So if we think back to our load restraint, uh, back to our tie down fundamentals, if, what, what's a critical to our restraint system? So we've got the downforce that's supplied by our struts, then we'll also get that friction value. So without that friction or high friction value, we can push down all we like with the straps on our load and we, we can get very minimal restraint. So no, you can't restrain a, uh, a wheeled item because the wheels are assumed to be moving forwards and backwards and therefore they provide us no frictional restraint. So in combination with our tie down systems, um, another thing we can also do is, is blocking, so blocking the load. So if you can block the load forwards on a truck, what you can do then is you, you're removing that 0.8 G or 80% of the mass load restraint requirement, and now you only need to restrain to a 0.5 G load restraint requirement with your tie down straps. So therefore we can get a better efficiency in terms of the amount of mass a strap will hold down for the same loading configuration. So possible things to block to is things like a headboard, rated headboard. Um, it could be a taut line, it could be rated curtains, tailgates, and headboards. But they must be rated to the restraint of effect. So when looking at blocking in our tight end table like we went through previously, um, you can, this really shows the benefit of blocking in terms of providing, covering that point HE force with your headboard. So if you look at the example on the right here, we've got two IVCs uh, at a total mass of two tonnes. You go through our table here of not being blocked on medium friction. We look at 90 degree lashing angle, we're looking at 600 kilos per strap. Uh, per, so for our two ton, therefore we need four webbing straps. Now, if we place that against the headboard, taking away that 0.8 G force. So going through this table here, if we're blocked forwards or medium friction, we're now getting 2.4 tons or 2,400 kilos per strap. So we're down to one strap for that whole row. Uh, so you can see there by remove by blocking that load forwards, I've actually removed three straps from that load in the same load in the same friction and uh, lashing component. So key risk with our blocking system is having a suitable blocking strength. So what we're putting our load against actually has the strength to withstand the force that the load's going to push on with it. So things like a pipe gate or a non reinforced pipe gate um, is, is something that you see a lot on semi trailers and they don't provide any strength for that rest uh, to prevent that load from pushing it. So when the load goes to move forwards, that, that uh, headboard basically will fail. So as, as you can see in the picture, the other thing to be aware of is gaps. We don't want to leave large gaps between our load and the headboard. Reason being that the load will build up a lot of energy as it goes to move forwards. And while it might be right, rated for a certain mass, it's not rated for the impact force and the energy that that load mass is going to push with. Most headboards have been designed with a load being applied to it without any moving or energy behind it due to gaps. So again, this is a good little video to talk that we can use to highlight the issue you can see with gaps.
see as the truck slows down, there's a delay between when it stops and the load comes through the back of the, the cab there. That's because the load initially had a, a substantial gap to that headboard and the headboard not having the strength to withstand that that impact from the load shift. Usually that gap's left because you're trying to maintain axle limits. So the type of load restraint system you could use is also containment. So when you look at containment, what you're doing is you're trying to contain the load within the body of the vehicle. So this is generally done on a lot of van type, Pantec type trucks. Also trucks like uh, we rated uh, curtains. So a key risk for a containing load is making sure whatever you're containing the load within has suitable strength. Uh, if something's really heavy and you've only got a light gauge uh, side on it, it's not likely to have that same just enough strength to prevent it from piercing through the, the the system and also bouncing out. So things like in the back of a ute or a, a truck, preventing them bouncing out over the sides of the, the tray itself. So you may think, you know, how high does it, the sides need to be to prevent something from, from falling out from it. So this example here is one where a this small excavator on the right here is actually hopped outside of the back of this rigid tipper. So the sides on the rigid tipper would be somewhere in the, the realm of at least a meter tall. What's happened here is, is the, the driver's been going down the road, hits a pothole with the steer tire, blows the steer tire, which causes the truck to, to veer to one sharply veer to one side of the road. As it's turning due to that steer tire dragging the truck to that way, the rear of the truck hits the same pothole and bounces that escalator up, and which therefore then tips over the outside of the, the, the side of the tray there. So just the combination of the, the turning force pushing the load sideways as well as the vertical uplift caused that um, escalator to jump out of the back of that uh, tipper. So nothing's too heavy to bounce out um, of, of a truck. So lucky that the passengers of the light vehicle there escape with no injury. So our final restraint system we'll go through today is attaching. So this is where you're attaching directly uh, quickly. Is you dr you're directly preventing that load from shifting due to the restraint, directly preventing that movement. So if you look at this EWP down the bottom here, if it tries to go forwards, the two chains on the back are preventing that load from moving forwards. It tries to go backwards, the two front ones are preventing it from going backwards. It tries to go to the left of the screen there, the two right chains are preventing that. And I just got a right screen, the two left ones are preventing that from occurring. So you're directly holding the load in all those directions to provide that to provide that performance standard level of restraint. So key things about your direct restraint is going to be the geometry of the lashings itself and also the strength of the lashings. So it's quite a complicated system. It doesn't it's not like high down where it's nice and easy and can look up a table. There actually are some calculations that are required to be completed to design a, a or to uh, design a, a direct attachment system. So if you move on through our, our, our session today, we go into weight distribution. So this is just highlighting some of the, the general axle allowances and mass allowances for uh, a standard general mass limits vehicle. So on a semi-trailer, you can see there, really had a GVM of 42 and a half ton. Um, and that then, so that's our maximum total mass of the, the vehicle. And then we've got individual axle limits that we can't go over either. So on the rear of the trailer, the triaxle, we're looking at 20 ton. On the drive axle, we've got 16 and a half. And then on the steer wheel, they've got six ton if it's an older vehicle, or six and a half if it's got Euro 5 underrun protection and uh, certain cab strength to, to make it able to have that extra half a ton of payload. This generally gives us a, a maximum payload of 24 ton, depending on how heavy your trailer is. Uh, but that load would have to sit in, in the exact right spot to be able to get, distribute that between the triaxle and the drive axle. So these axle masses are mainly made up from the pavement loading of those vehicles, of those wheels. So if you go down to a B double, we're looking at 62 and a half ton. So again, we've got the same 20 ton on both the triaxles on the trailers. That's because they're all both three, three axle, uh, four tires per axle uh, systems. And then you go to the drive again, we're looking at 16 and a half and that steer, we've got that six ton or six and a half ton, depending on 
whether you got the Euro 5 and underarm protection. That gives you a, a general payload of around 42 tonnes. Looking at rigids, we're starting a standard single axle rigid. So you're looking at around 15 tonne GVM with a, a, a drive axle of around nine tonne and a steer axle again of six or six and a half, depending on whether you have the, the extra uh, allowances on the truck. And that gives you an average payload around 10 tonnes. You go to a dual axle vehicle, you're looking at 22 and a half tonne with around six or six and a half tonne on the steer again and 16 and a half tonne on that dual drive. So again, it's all based on the pavement loadings, depends on how much of that those axle loadings you get. Going to dimensions limits, so uh, this is pretty similar across uh, certain parts of these dimension limits are pretty similar depending on a uh, rigid or semi-trailer. So our over height, our height limit is 4.3 metres. Our width limit is 2.5 metres with a maximum 1.5 either side past the vehicle body. We allow 1.2 metres to the headlight in front of the, a rigid. And then the rear is the same on a rigid or a semi-trailer. It's going to be the less, the lower number of 3.75 meters or 60% of the wheelbase or the S length. And the S length is the, the distance between the kingpin and the tri center of the triaxle. So in some in some cases, some rigids you'll find that the actual overhang, maximum overhang from the vehicle, because this is measured from the center of the rear axle group, may actually not be able to go past the tray because the tray is actually built to the, the maximum length limit, uh, rear overhang limit. Uh, if you do go past the tray, you're looking at, if you go past 1.2 metres, you're going to need a flag or light in uh, low light conditions. So moving on, if you're ever in, uh, in using dunnage uh, with a load, so you'd use the dunnage to try and lift that load up off the deck to get things like your forklift times underneath. What you want to be look at, and also you could be using it to improve the friction uh, for a tight end system. So, what you want to look at is generally you want to look at hardware, hardwood somewhere around the 100 mil by 100 mil square section. Make sure it's nice and strong. Uh, and and we, what we do is make sure it doesn't roll. If your dunnage rolls over and reduces in height, you're going to lose some of your restraint capacity. Uh, you lose your lashing tension because you reduce the height of the load. So. What you always want, always want to look at for your dunnage is making sure the corners aren't round, it's not damaged. Um, you don't want to stack it in a tall stack. You want to do something like rillage instead and build up that way. And if you've got rectangular dunnage, you always want to use the dunnage on the long edge rather than the short edge to prevent that toggling risk. Looking at lashing equipment. So if you're looking at chain, uh, generally uh, it's going to be rated to Australian standard. Um, you get any wear in it, you're looking at any 10% wear, you've got to discard the chain and track it out. Um, this will generally happen in between the links. So if you're looking at a mil chain, if it wears past 0.8 of the mil, you've got to track that chain out. That's because you're reducing the capacity of the chain. Looking at chain binders, how you do it with your chain. So generally you want to avoid maxi, uh, avoid over center binders or dogs. Um, they generally on the way out, uh, they should be on the way out already. And work cover doesn't look kindly if, you, if you're using them and you have an incident because they how dangerous they are. So your general uh, replacements for that would be, which you see a lot in the industry, are, are things like a maxi binder or an Oz binder. Uh, you do see some web dogs. Uh, turnbuckles are quite common in mobile plant and heavy haulage. And then also you've got the other options like the EV cam, which isn't quite as popular as some of the other items. Going through our weaving straps, so usually the 15 mil weaving straps are rated two and a half ton. Um, they can stretch large amounts, so up to 12%. So you don't want to use them in combination with chain. If you get any any cuts in them past 10% of its width, so on a 15 mil weaving strap, you've got to cut that five millimeters thick on that strap. You've got to discard that strap and get a new one. That's because you're reducing the strength of that strap by cutting the fibers on that strap. Uh, if you tie it in or not, you'll generally have them fail about one ton. So uh, you never want to use that to join them together. So going through key points of our load restraint fundamentals, the law is based on the performance standards or their G force, so 0.8 G forwards or 80% of the load forwards, 0.5 G or 50% sideways and rearwards, and we've got 0.2 or 20% vertically, um, depending on fusing friction. 
forwards force is usually the governing because it's a large number so you always want to either have it blocked or, or make sure you've got it covered uh, low friction is always high risk in a tie down restraint system you always want to try and prove that friction factor low restraint is more than handling lashings so uh, it's making sure you get the right systems in place you want to minimize your gaps if you're containing or you're blocking to a headboard um, ensure something can't your items can't bounce out and if you've got damage make sure it's not going to roll over because that can be a real danger to your restraint system so thank you for for listening through to this uh, load strength fundamentals course if you have any questions around the training please contact turf new south wales uh, thank you